Uh, and thank you for inviting me for the lecture series. I'm pleased to be here. Several of you, several of you this morning were in the session. Uh, apparently you have capacity to receive more of the good news, uh, which I want to continue with uh, right now in a, a more formal way, which of the settings appropriate for it. I want to talk about uh, the development of a fairly new perspective in criminology that uh, several of us have been working on, or well, maybe for the last three years. And uh, we're trying to get together some writing and research in that perspective, the peacemaking perspective. There are various ways of going about it. Some are doing it through feminist theory and criminology, uh, some through uh, what's called left realism, particularly in uh, England and uh, Europe. Um, and in deconstruction uh, postmodernist uh, theory uh, as well. And uh, so there are various ways of doing it. Uh, and, and mine is, is my particular way of doing it, uh, drawing particularly, as we talked this morning, from, oh, the movement of Eastern thought, Eastern philosophy, Eastern religion uh, to the West. And this is one way of, uh, of approaching the, uh, the peace perspective. Also, uh, a number of people have been concerned, particularly over the last 10 years, of how to develop or continue a left-oriented progressive social theory within criminology. And uh, in order to ground it, uh, it's, it seems to be necessary to relate to some political social movement within our context here and now in the United States. And uh, it seems to, taking my own experiences, sharing those around me, it seems to be within the peace movement with the United States, thus the, the grounding of this. So, and then I want to relate it to criminology, obviously, or I hope obviously. So I want to begin with the realization that no amount of thinking and no amount of public policy have brought us any closer to understanding and solving the crime problem. We have taken a turn more to the right with the administrations of uh, Nixon and Reagan and probably with Bush. Uh, and still, uh, even with these approaches, particularly with these approaches, we're no closer to solving the problem of crime. The more we, we have reacted to crime, the farther we removed ourselves from any understanding and reduction of the problem. In recent years, we've floundered desperately in formulating the law punishing the offender, and quantifying our knowledge. Yet this country remains one of the most crime-ridden nations. In spite of all of its wealth, economic development, and scientific advances, this country has one of the worst crime records in the world. We're not as smart as we think we are. With this realization, we return once again, as if starting anew, to the subject of crime, a subject that remains one of the most critical indicators of the state of our personal and collective being. This is our interest, particularly one of our interests in criminal justice and criminologists, whether we're practitioners or academicians, that the field opens to us, provides a window for the nature of our being, the nature of our society. If what is to be said seems outrageous and heretical this afternoon, it is only because it is necessary necessarily outside of the conventional wisdom of our understanding of the problem of crime and of our attempt to solve it. Only by entering another world, yet one that is very simple and ultimately true, it seems to me, can we become aware of our condition. I'd like to make a few elementary observations. First, that human existence is characterized by suffering, that crime is suffering, and the sources of suffering are within each of us. Whether we're criminals or non-criminals, we are in a, a similar condition of suffering. Through love and compassion, 
terms that we don't use often in criminology or any of the social sciences. Through love and compassion, beyond the ego-centered self, we can end suffering and live in peace personally and collectively. The ending of suffering can be attained in a quieting of the mind, an opening of the heart, in contemplation, in being particularly aware. Not necessarily more knowledge, but being aware, as we talked about this morning. Crime can be ended, it follows, crime can be ended only with the ending of suffering, only when there is peace, through love and compassion found in awareness. We have crime because we do not have social peace. In order to deal with crime, we have to deal with the social peace. In a way, we have an armed struggle, uh, a domestic war going on around crime. It's our, it's our war at home. Understanding, service, justice, all these flow naturally from the above points on suffering and love and compassion. And finally, a criminology of peacemaking, as I want to call it, a criminology of peacemaking, a nonviolent criminology of compassion and service, seeks to end suffering and thereby eliminate crime. I'd like to elaborate on this understanding or these, these assumptions. First, talk about suffering to make a case that we are suffering, whether we're criminals or non-criminals. Suffering, then, is the condition of our existence. The forms of suffering are all around us. In our personal lives, there are tensions and anxieties. Each day we experience the physical pains in our bodies and the psychological hurts in our hearts and minds. Our interpersonal relations are often carried out in violence of one kind or another, if only in the withholding of what might be offered. We have created societies that are filled with the sufferings of poverty, hunger, homelessness, pollution, and destruction of the environment. Globally, nations are at war and threaten not only one another, but all of earthly life with nuclear destruction. All of these human problems or forms of suffering are a result of how we have lived our lives moment by moment, day by day. They're not the result only of what the great powers and the leaders of great powers have done, but they spring first from the way we live our lives. The threat of nuclear war began as a suffering on a very personal level and elevated gradually and systematically to the collective level. The forms of suffering are symptoms of the sufferings within each of us. We are not separate from the global problems. They are within us. They spring from us. If the social and global sufferings ever are to be ended, we must deal with the suffering of personal existence. What is involved, finally, is no less than the transformation of our human being. Political, economic, or military solutions without this transformation inevitably fail. And uh, continuing then, any solutions to crime that are apart from dealing with our own sufferings cannot solve the problem of crime. The solution then is very near to us. It's not out there. It's very near to us. There's no shortcut to the ending of suffering. Our suffering then and our ending of this suffering begins in the human mind. The Dhammapada, the ancient text of Buddhism, states, all that we are is a result of what we have thought. We act out our thoughts and we create social worlds out of these thoughts. Being human, we've constructed webs of meaning. With these shared meanings, we've constructed our interpersonal relations, our social structures, and our societies, all as a result of what we have thought. We are the thinking animal and has great consequences. The construction of our existence, the end of suffering, thus begins by giving attention to the mind. It is this mind, a modern mind that is busy and scattered, that creates its own suffering. To be able to observe the mind as it is, is to be able to see clearly with the mind, we begin what must seem at first a paradox of letting go. 
The author of a book titled The Gradual Awakening observes, in letting go of who we imagine ourselves to be, letting go of our thinking, our attempt to control the world, we come upon our natural being, which has been waiting patiently all these years for us to come home. This open state of mind is what one Zen master calls a beginner's mind. He writes, if your mind is empty, it is always ready for anything. It is open to everything. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. Dictated, us for our, dictated to us by our uh, passed down knowledge and policies. We are ready to see things then as they really are beyond concepts and theories. When we have no thought of achievement, no thought of self, when our mind is open and thus compassionate towards earth, all things, it is boundless in its, un, in its understanding. In other words, to know or to be aware, we first must let go of much, to be open of what could be. Without empty mind, without mindfulness, another way of expressing it, mindfulness, we are attached to our ideas, our thoughts, our mental constructions, and we take these products to be reality itself. They're ideas, they're thoughts, they're not reality. Many of our concepts are so deeply ingrained in our minds, in our education, and in our culture, that we forget that they completely condition our perceptions of reality. In attachment to these mental productions, we are chained to the cave, observing merely the shadows of appearance on the wall before us. Awareness is a breaking of the chains of conditioned thought, of much of our received education in criminal justice or otherwise. Being attached to our thoughts, we take the thoughts to be our true selves. The mind that is attached to its own thoughts is the mind of a self-centered, possessive being. All conditioned and attached thought arises from the discursive mind of the ego-centered self. That is why the sacred texts of the esoteric traditions, such as the wisdom literature of early Hinduism, is found in the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, suggests that truth can be known only through Brahman, through that which is beyond the ego self and its attempt at purely rational thought. In contemplation and meditation, we can see the essence of all things as they rise and pass away. The higher wisdom, the awareness of reality, can be attained only then with the loss of the conditioned ego and much of the knowledge that we've already received, whatever our education in the West, in the United States. As we mature, it seems, we move beyond the rational and linear mode of thought to a more intuitive and transcendent mode. We lose the grasping and craving self of the individualized ego and find ourselves in the realm of the universal self, the self with a capital S as in Hinduism, the self that's a part of everything else. It is not natural, it seems. In fact, it is unhealthy for the academic, the intellectual, sociologist, criminologist, to continue strictly in the rational mode of speculation and dualistic thought as he or she matures, although this is the approved and rewarded form for the academic life. To continue solely in the rational mode of thought is regressive for the maturing person and for the discipline as well. I think our academic structures tend to keep us in an adolescent mode. And as we mature, it requires a different kind of mode to be truly human and seems to me a different kind of mode to be scholars uh, and to be intellectuals, though this goes against the, the conditioned notion of what it is. The truth is that no amount of theorizing and conceptual thinking can tell us much about reality. The further we think, the more we theorize, the further we get away from reality. To enter into the essential realm requires a mind that is unattached and compassionate. In a book on perennial wisdom, Aldous Huxley writes, 
It is a fact confirmed and reconfirmed during 2,000 years of religious history that the ultimate reality is not clearly and immediately apprehended except by those who have made themselves loving, pure in heart, and poor in spirit. When we allow the higher self to dwell in the particular self, we can attend to the known, to the unknown, and the unknowable mysteries of the world. And much of that mystery is captured in the notion of crime and the behavior that we call crime. And the final expression of this realization may not be in more talk, in more words, but in silence. This morning we talked about thinking, about criminological theory, and part of the message was you have to be careful. There can be, thought can be as much of the problem as anything else. And I'm suggesting that in silence much can be known or attended to. St. John of the Cross observed, for whereas speaking distracts, which I'm doing now, for whereas speaking distracts, silence and work collect thoughts and strengthen the spirit. With the wisdom gained by awareness, there can be no further need, there may be no further need to talk and to write discursively. One then practices what is realized with attention in silence, charity, and humility in the service of others. I'd like to say some things now about awareness that I've been alluding to, sometimes opposed to what we think is knowledge. The way of awareness, and thus the ending of suffering, begins with right understanding. An understanding of the true nature of reality involves the recognition that everything is impermanent, that nothing remains the same. Within the flux of reality is the fact that every action begins, brings a certain response. For instance, whenever our actions are motivated by greed, hatred, or delusion, the inevitable result is suffering. All of this occurs within a reality that is beyond the abstractions of the grasping and craving mind. Is then the presumed objectivity and rationality of modern science and a science that affects our criminal justice and criminology that we hope to avoid in this developing perspective. We hope to avoid the personal and social consequences of positive science. For as one humanistic philosopher has noted, The mind trained in objective science over a number of years, and how many of us have done this? We've all been a part of this. The the mind trained in objective science over a number of years becomes cold, dry, uncaring, always atomized, cutting, analyzing. This kind of mind has lost the capacity, he writes, concludes, for empathy, compassion and love. That's a strong charge against what we do daily in the name of science. Our mode of thinking affects then, suggesting our mode of thinking affects the way we live, and in the meantime we have not gotten any closer to understanding. Not only does it hurt us and others, but doesn't get us any closer to understanding. We seek a mind that instead of producing conflict and violence, heals a compassionate mind rather than an objective mind. The compassionate mind is found beyond the boundaries of Western scientific rationality, at least as practiced most of the time now. Being on the simple path of right understanding, we create thoughts, words, and deeds that will end our suffering. The forest monk Achen Cha writes, only when our words and deeds come from kindness Can we quiet the mind and open the heart? Our our thoughts come from some place. We are what we think. We have to be careful then where they're coming from. Our work is not only to grow in wisdom and compassion, but also to help others in their suffering. And I would think we are dealing with the essence of suffering around criminal justice. 
This takes place not necessarily in further theoretical work, but in moment-by-moment, day-by-day, step-by-step awareness of what actually is. We are on a wandering path, as Buddhists would call, to emptiness. That is, to an awareness of the fullness and wholeness of all things. That we, as criminologists, are to be engaged in spiritual work in order, among other things, to eliminate crime may require further reflection. To be fully human proposes, presupposes the development within oneself of the quality of being that transcends material existence. It is a quality that is not acquired automatically, but one that develops slowly and needs to be tended carefully. Through inner work, we forge a link between the profane and the sacred. Indeed, all of life becomes filled with the sacred. Such a quality within each of us assures a life of growing wisdom, compassion, and service. Nothing any longer, then, is profane without the transcendent dimension. The simplest actions, from eating and drinking to talking and working, have a sacramental quality signifying something beyond themselves. Our lives are within a realm that demands a spiritual as well as material existence. This is why the great religious traditions continue to emphasize a constant discipline of recollection, meditation, study, prayer, and contemplation, and at least a measure of solitude and retirement. The Trappist monk Thomas Merton thus writes, If salvation of society depends in the long run on the moral and spiritual health of individuals, the subject of contemplation becomes a vastly important one, since contemplation is one of the indications of spiritual maturity. It is closely allied to sanctity. You cannot save the world merely with a system, including a criminal justice system. You cannot have peace without charity, he concludes a new way of thinking about what we do. Seeing the truth in contemplation and meditation, we are on a path that promotes a humane and peaceful existence. This is the reality that we can attain only in a life lived in the depth of the sacred. A life devoted to criminology cannot avoid the importance of this truth. Care has to be taken, given to the inner life of each of us that we as criminal justice workers, as criminologists, should attend to our spiritual life uh, is something that I'm arguing for here. This life of giving attention to spiritual matters, of going beyond the self to all that is in the world, is a socially committed life. It's not individualistic. The contemplative life is not self-indulgent, for social issues cannot be faced appropriately without inner spiritual preparation. Oppression in the world is caused by cells that are not spiritually aware, by those who live by greed, fear, egoism, the craving for power over others. As Jacob Needleman observed in his book, Lost Christianity, the inner world, that is the outer world, is not out there, and the inner world is not solely one of personal emotions and thoughts. Both are of the same quality, the same space, in interpenetration of everything. The objective, then, is a compassionate living of each moment with all other beings for the ending of suffering. Were there complete perfection and unity there would be no suffering. Suffering has arisen out of disunity and separation from the totality and can be ended only with the return of all beings to a condition of wholeness. We have fallen, to use the expression, we have fallen from the grace of wholeness into a separation from one another and from the ground of all being. A separation that is assured by our craving and grasping cells by cells that are really an illusion. If human beings were constantly and consciously in a proper relationship with the sacred, 
natural and social environment, there would only be as much suffering as creation itself makes inevitable. But our own created reality is one of separation and therefore of suffering. Thus the healing of the separation is necessary if suffering is to be ended. Remember at all times I'm saying suffering and also saying all that we include is crime. To begin to end suffering, we must be aware of the causes of suffering within ourselves by searching for the reasons that make us suffer. In the practice of what Buddhists call metta, or loving kindness, there has developed a feeling of caring and connectedness. From within, thoughts of goodwill and benevolence are extended outward, embracing all others in an increasing wider circle. In compassion, the suffering of others is recognized out of one's own suffering, and the suffering is shared. Uh, Jack Cornfield writes, Compassion is the tender readiness of the heart to respond to one's own or another's pain without grief or resentment or aversion. It is the wish to dissipate suffering. Compassion embraces those experiencing sorrow and eliminates cruelty from the mind. Looking directly at suffering then, both the suffering of the world and the suffering within our own heart and mind, we love others as ourselves and act in compassion to end suffering, to heal the separation. We begin to practice then, we begin our practice by being aware of the ways in which suffering are manifested in each of us. The more conscious we are in dealing with our own suffering, the more sensitive we will be in treating the pain of others. We begin then by working with ourselves when we work in criminal justice. We are not that much different from those that we are to treat, to correct, and punish. They are an extension of our own lives in maybe most dramatic forms. Our responsibility is to do what we can to alleviate the concrete conditions of human suffering. We work to provide food for the hungry, shelter for the homeless, health care for the sick and feeble, protection for the threatened and vulnerable, schooling for the uneducated, freedom for the oppressed. Acknowledging what is, that is the situation, and acknowledging what is, acting as witnesses to this shared reality without attachment and judgment, we open ourselves to all suffering. Acting out of compassion without thinking of ourselves as doers, we are witnesses to what must be. The path to the ending of suffering is through compassion rather than through the theories of science and the calculations of conditioned thought. Our sufferings are in fact exacerbated by science and thought. The discoveries necessary for dealing with suffering are within our being. The truth that relieves suffering lies in the concrete moment of our awareness, an awareness that frees us from conditioned judgments, creates loving kindness within us, and allows us to realize the absolute emptiness, to use the term, the absolute emptiness of all phenomena. That is, the wholeness, the fullness beyond our imagination. As long as there is suffering in this world, each of us suffers. We cannot end our suffering without ending the suffering, ending the suffering of all others. In being witnesses to the concrete reality, and in attempting to heal the separation between ourselves and true being, we necessarily suffer with all others. But now we are fully aware of the suffering and realize how it can be eliminated. With awareness and compassion, we are then ready to act. From the inner understanding of our own suffering, we are prepared to act in a way of, to use the word, peace. As in Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy, the Satagara, truth force, social action comes out of the informed heart out of the clear and enlightened mind. This is why there can be no peace without attending first to the realization of our suffering and a way of developing 
awareness. The source of social action is within the human heart that has come to fully understand its own suffering and therefore the suffering of others. If human actions are not rooted in compassion, these actions will not contribute to a peaceful and compassionate world. No matter what we do, how good-hearted we think we are, if they do not come from our own peace, then they cannot result in, in outer peace. Uh, a quote here from uh, Ram Dass and Gorman in their book, How Can I Help? If we cannot move beyond inner discord, how can we help find a way to social harmony? If we ourselves cannot know peace, be peaceful, how will our acts disarm hatred and violence? This means, the means then cannot be different from the ends. Peace can come only out of peace. There is no way to peace, A.J. Musty wrote. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. In other words, without inner peace in each of us, without peace of mind and heart, there can be no social peace between people and no peace in societies, nations, and in the world. And what I've suggested is that crime is the absence of peace. So the inference is we would do well to work to the elimination of crime by dealing at the same time first anyway, first or at the same time with the problems of peace in our own selves. Otherwise, we are engaged in the same violence that we're trying to cure. To be explicitly engaged in this process of bringing about peace on all levels, of joining ends and means, is to be engaged in peacemaking. It's something we all do. We all can do. In peacemaking, we attend to the ultimate purpose of our existence, to heal the separation between all things and to live harmoniously in a state of unconditioned love. The radical nature of peacemaking is clear. That is, it's no less than the transformation of our human being, the transformation of ourselves. Rather than attempting to create a good society first and then trying to make ourselves better human beings, we have to work on the two simultaneously. You know, we all have the idea. We can, uh, particularly as, as policy makers or academicians, we can create policies that would make a good world and then somehow we will be good people and eliminate crime. And I'm saying that it has to be the other way around. Or the two have to go together. The inner and the outer, then, are the same. The transformation of ourselves and the world becomes our constant practice here and now. We cannot transform the world. We cannot eliminate crime without transforming ourselves. We transform not only criminals, but we transform ourselves, maybe before we can transform criminals. The practice is in the true sense spiritual and religious. In Buddhist terms, we become enlightened in the practice. In Christianity, the transformation involves an inner conversion, a new age coming in both cases only when we have made ourselves ready. As one commentator on the Catholic peace tradition writes, peace is not so much political revolution as personal conversion. It is not individual human ego and power at stake, but God's will to peace that only humans can accomplish on earth as they are the recipient of God's gift and the challenge of peace. And there can be no peace without justice. Inner peace is the beginning. There also has to be justice. This is the biblical command drawing from our Western tradition, Christian tradition, Judeo-Christian tradition. There could be no peace without justice. The good social life 
one based on equality, with the elimination of poverty, racism, sexism, and violence of all kinds, including that which is included under crime, can come about only with a peaceful existence. We can't have disharmony. We can't have social love, disunity, the lack of peace, and still eliminate these problems, which are social problems as much as they are justice problems. The Old Testament Isaiah states, justice will bring about peace, right will produce calm and security. Peace then, the result of all the benefits of the covenant, is granted to those who fulfill the covenant by living in justice. Peace and justice are thus inextricably bound, cause and effect, journey and goal. By living the covenant, that is by creating justice, there is peace. The peacemakers are truly, in this sense, uh, the children of God. All of this is to say to us as criminologists, as criminal justice workers, that crime is suffering and that the ending of crime is possible only with the ending of suffering. And the ending both of suffering and of crime, the establishing of justice, can come only out of peace, out of a peace that is spiritually grounded in our very being. To eliminate crime to end the construction and perpetuation of existence that makes crime possible requires a transformation of our human being. It's not an easy thing we're engaged in. We as human beings must be peace if we are to live in a world free of crime, in a world of peace. The problem is not just the criminals, the problem is us. Criminals are just an extension of the way we live our lives. In recent years, we've seen several attempts at peacemaking and criminology. There have been writings and some programs employing conflict resolution, mediation, reconciliation, abolition, and humanitarian actions of various kinds. They offer the concrete beginnings of a criminology of peacemaking, a criminology that seeks to end suffering and thereby eliminating crime. It is a criminology that is based necessarily on human transformation in the achievement of peace and justice. Human transformation takes place as we change our social, economic, and political structure. And the message is clear. Without peace within us and in our actions, there can be no peace in our results. If our actions are based on violence, and see, punishment is nothing other than violence, even carried out with a good heart or for the larger purpose, is still violence and thus cannot end violence. Peace is the way. We are fully aware by now that the criminal justice system in this country is founded on violence. It is a system that assumes that violence can be overcome by violence, evil by evil. Criminal justice at home and warfare abroad are of the same principles of violence. This principle sadly dominates much of our criminology, our thinking, our theorizing, as well as our practice. Fortunately, more and more criminologists are realizing that this principle is fundamentally incompatible with a faith that seeks to express itself in compassion, forgiveness, and love. Recognizing that the criminal justice system is the moral equivalent of the war machine, resistance to the one goes hand in hand with resistance to the other. Resistance must be in compassion and love, not in terms of the violence that is being resisted, though. A definition of nonviolence by a recent resistor is appropriate. Let me quote him. Nonviolence is a method of struggling for human liberation that resists and refuses to cooperate with evil or injustice while trying to show goodwill to all opponents encountered in the struggle and being willing to take suffering on oneself rather than inflicting it on others. 
we are back again to the internal source of our actions. Action is the form, the essence of our being takes. Uh, a Buddhist monk and peace activist, Thich Nhat Hanh, writes as follows. The chain reaction of love is the essential nature of the struggle. The usual way to generate force is to create anger, desire, and fear in people. Hatred, desire, and fear are sources of energy. If you don't do this, you'll be punished. We tell this to our children, and we form a criminal justice system based on that. Hatred, desire, and fear are sources of energy. But a nonviolent struggle cannot use these dangerous sources of energy, he writes, for they destroy both the people taking part in the struggle and the aim of the struggle itself. But a nonviolent struggle, he ends, must be nurtured by love and compassion. Engaging in trying to eliminate violence by a form that is violence will personally destroy ourselves. We have our own best interest in formulating, thinking about, acting in ways that are nonviolent. Thus to conclude, when our hearts are filled with love and our minds with a willingness to serve, we will know what is to be done and how it is to be done. Such is the basis of a nonviolent criminology, a peacemaking criminology. We begin then by attending to the direction of our innermost being, the being that is the whole of reality. Out of this source, all action follows. In the words of the Chinese Taoist Lao Tzu, no action is taken, and yet nothing is left undone if we place ourselves correctly, if we make ourselves ready. There is an abate on what should be done. Correct action follows from being from our form of life. Everything is done out of compassion to help the lessening of suffering of others, including ourselves. Living in harmony with truth, we do everything as an act then of service. Not as criminal justice as we traditionally think of it, but as service to eliminate suffering. Criminology, finally, can be no less than this, it seems to me, a way of peace, a part of the movement towards peace in the world, and it's the part that we, we can play even as we do criminal justice at the moment if we can be transformed in the process. So I want to end there with these formal thoughts and uh, maybe we have something we can talk about together and clarify or help each other with. Talk to questions, and so I'm going to take the role of moderator, presuming that much of what we've been exposed to are is perhaps in the form of questions. Does anyone have any answers that they would like to offer, uh, or in the form of questions? I certainly want to encourage the question. Continuation of this morning's discussion, also, that, that many of you are here for. It takes a while to uh, get back on your feet <laughs> after uh, entering this place. Uh, and discursive thought is part of my message. Uh, it's not necessary to get us there, but I'm asking for discursive thought. I mean, I'm entertaining the possibility. So in a way, I'm contradicting the message. I realize that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes. Was the first step. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, this morning we asked you for example. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's the one. Those are the examples we can conceive of where we are at the moment. Uh, once.
putting yourself in such a position of peacemaking, other things can be developed. And I think that's our creative part now. Uh, and here at the school. You're, you're meaning as a, us playing a part in the conflict resolution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or being mediators or learning conflict resolution techniques. I don't know if uh, that's a part of a, a curriculum. But in some places... Uh, is that, is the other thing part of a media conflict resolution any different than the treatment on the street like a conflict? Well, perhaps conflict. Mm-hmm. Perhaps that's what's going on. Perhaps they perceive it but that way, I don't know. I think so. I think we talked about Mm-hmm. 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 That can well be. I know in my teaching, I'm much closer to the peacemaking perspective teaching uh, police and than I am often with undergraduates otherwise. Mm-hmm. But it uh, depends what kind you're talking about. A couple nights ago, I saw the film uh, A Dry White Season about apartheid in South Africa and the special unit of police of uh, I don't know if you've seen the film. It makes you... This kind of approach is confirmed. Mm-hmm. To try to be on the right side. Mm-hmm. You know that generally the perspective of having to be Yeah. What well, seems to me, in spite of still things like apartheid, and dictatorships in Central America and the, the horrors every day. And at the same time, there are the, the movements going on within Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, China. Uh, call it the democracy movement. That you think that the is getting too light? Then that kind of thing may need to know that you're a big Yes. Mm-hmm. It seems to me much is happening outside of criminal justice. That we, just on an intellectual and practical way within our work, need to be aware of. Certainly spiritually important for us to be aware of because we are what we eat. We are what we work. If we are engaged in a violent kind of work, we are that. What's the difference between us and the criminals, you know? Uh, so what I'm trying to do, uh, suggest here, is to, much is going on outside of crimin- uh, criminology, criminal justice, <clears throat> that needs to be brought into what we do and to transform our own work. Mm-hmm. Um, pardon me? Uh huh. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Most of us who have spent much of a lifetime in one academy or another, university or college, school. Uh, have pretty much bought the idea, been conditioned, that the only way to know is rationally coming to us from the age of enlightenment. And part of the the dualism of separation of ourselves from what's being studied and that we can be objective. But more and more, the more phenomenological, humanistic perspective is changing science, certainly in the hardest of sciences, so to speak. uh, Physics, theoretical physics, applied physics, Uh, a more phenomenological, softer, non-rational, almost religious quality permeates it. And it's strange that in the social sciences, much of the social sciences, we still hang on to this older model of a science that doesn't seem to work. It doesn't help us understand reality. It doesn't make the world better. And it doesn't help us, our own souls. And that's kind of the part of the move 
movement that I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't mean that we don't appeal to the mind and what's called rationality, but it becomes something different when the heart and the mind go together. I mean, you can theorize a thing to death and still not understand it, and also further remove yourself from it. Ultimately, you have to open your being to it. Otherwise, you become that what you do, which is, as the one philosopher said, cold hearted. Mm-hmm. Not much. Uh, there's still the argument that, you know, a, a part of the prison population, 10%, whatever, so far gone in our society that incapacitation is the only way, but that for a much larger part of the population, uh, other forms can better open people. Mm-hmm. Well, this morning we mentioned a bit, uh, you know, Elliot Curry's book, uh, Confronting Crime, looks at the rehabilitation correctional programs Uh, community programs, rehabilitation within the prisons, dealing with the families, uh, with housing, were programs that did not fail, but they were ended because the politics changed, administrations changed, and that these programs are still useful in improving the material and spiritual lot of people. I mean, those are, are peacemaking ways that will come around again, it seems, you know? And we aren't going to go immediately to uh, you know, some other form outside the criminal justice system. Much of this will be done within the criminal justice system. Mediation will be learned by criminal justice workers, for example, conflict resolution. And, but to ignore these moves is, is not to move to any place, it seems to me. You might say it's, the long, it's a long view. What do you do in the meantime? In the meantime, you begin doing these things. In the good world, you won't need a criminal justice system, right? I mean, that'd be a, you know, so, so forth. You say that's idealistic. I mean, it's, we do what we can with our own time. Now we're working with a criminal justice system. And the thing is to make that good work. You know, right livelihood, right action. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yes, excuse me. Mm-hmm. What kind of beings? Moral. Yes. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. If the current duty of society doesn't have the kind of justice, and you have said that justice is bring about peace, then who's justice? My justice, your justice, justice of the whole, justice of the innocent. Hopefully, legal justice has something to do with justice. And we're talking about, to begin with, justice in the big sense of the law, whether it's the, the dharma, you know, the law. Uh, and that the legal system is in correspondence with that and doesn't represent the interest of a greedy few. Mm-hmm. And that when there is that kind of justice, which means equality, ending of poverty, and so forth, then there can be peace. But as long as <clears throat> there's racism, sexism, poverty, these things created by, particularly our society does well in creating these things, generates these things, then there cannot be peace as long as there are those conditions. Crime is just the effect of all those. I mean, the, a symbol of all those, or a response to all those. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> what do you call that? Natural law? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
been doing is talking one way about it, the way I talk about it. You all have different ways of doing it, you know, and uh, this is just my particular kind of talk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good way to begin. It doesn't have any place. Uh, you yeah. know, dealing, developing a philosophy for our own time and place. And we don't <clears throat> stay rigidly to the form like the Bhagavad Gita because it said something, you know, like punishment. That doesn't mean we, we must, to be purist, follow that. One of the exciting things about Eastern thought is being transformed in the course of its coming to the West. Uh, one point we made this morning is that it's been observed that much of Eastern thought the Buddhism has been fairly static for 2,000 years. It's really in the last 50 years that it's just taken off, combining Eastern and West with a new kind of synthesis and a new development within Buddhism. So, you know, nothing is ironclad, you know, from the past. And this is an exciting time where we are trying to create a new world and rejecting us some or transforming some of our our conditioned thought that we grew up in our own lifetime and uh, are here for one place in this school where new things can be developed, new sensibilities developing. This is this amazing time we're in. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as having compassionate towards uh, a rapist, I don't know, why can I take that on, you know? Uh, what would feminist theory say about that? It seems to me there's one, there is an opening to an understanding and a compassion of what's going on, you know, as a society that's brutalized people. Now, response, that's still be worked out. I mean, I don't have the answer. Think you know, about I don't have the answer. The addition of the woman experiences an which responds with our growth and vengeance and anger, okay. not only towards the perpetrator, but towards the earth. So what we have certainly is not answering the film her needs. Think about the family of the young man who was sacrificed to the saving of the day down in Mexico. What was their response? It was one of those compassion and, and prayer for the perpetrators as well as for us as a society kind of Now that's asking a lot. 
Yes. It's not, it's not, it's not, this isn't a simple mm -hmm. call to him, but that, that's a peace-filled response to a very personal victim. Mm -hmm. The Sermon on the Mount is a good place for us who live within this Western tradition to begin. Forgiveness, reconciliation, whatever provides a model for, in this case, because of the public exposure to millions of people. The VORP program for the, uh, it's the Mennonite Church, isn't it? Victim Offender Reconciliation Program is just that, where the offender and the victim are brought together and it transforms both. This is really Yes. Right. Right. Oh yeah. Sure. That that response generates what's needed to not have the behavior in the first place. There are that understanding compassion towards the other person that wouldn't be the rape, the rape to begin with. But to respond with punishment and violence is to say, well, go on with your behavior, we're doing it. Okay. This, is called, this is called the ice age. Basically, philosophically, but the difficulty I see is the uh, flip side. If you quoted Isaiah, and Isaiah talks about justice and righteousness. Uh, it takes the term number of times in the book. Um, you, you've also basically, or you are calling for personal life. And I think, in a sense, that's, that's the tough part of it. I mean, as we're saying, a criminal justice is going to agree to straighten their own lives out and become righteous. Mm -hmm. And we go on with this book. Yes. The basic course in criminal justice would be course in righteousness, right? Yeah. Righteousness 101. <laughs> yeah, oh, all right. It's an evangelical endeavor in a Sure. Mm. Right, we're the example, you know, if we can transform ourselves, then we are in the process of transforming those other parts that are ourselves who become criminal. I thought last night you were on the twilight zone. <laughs> That's where we are. The new, the new, the new version of the product was a, a segment about just this question. What is an appropriate response? Peace filled response. And it's been the most recent one. Yeah. And I think it's a great response. But I don't know if it's a good response. Well, they have this system whereby the person who's sent it was invisibility for a year. The Amish do it as a shunning. Too violent, 
with violence, it escalates. Instead of stopping it, and our look, we have we have the ability within ourselves not to respond violently. That's what I don't think that it has changed the status of that group of people at all. They're still where, where we fight them. Because we're struggling with them, we're fighting with them, instead of bringing them in. And, and by bringing them in, that means us joining them as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hmm? Who's, who's got it? I don't believe he has a vision, for example. Yeah. He used to be the big town. The market is there. I think that the worst part of that is not to be enough. He's still a person. But he was a better person. He seems to be like this before. I think he said. Yeah, well, you, sure, you resist oppressive regimes. And as much as following Gandhi is possible, what a nonviolence resistance that would bring about change would be like. And that's created in every situation anew, probably. But you don't tolerate oppression and... No. Oppression is fine. And that works for peace. So what do you have to do? To violence? Yeah, because it's not violence. That is what we act to say, actively, in order to buy the time. And people are losing it, it's a good part of it. The people are not standing up and pushing out of people's hands. Which were the biggest pieces that we still never lose at this part of it? And then we're in a bit more peaceful than we did. Well, if people could be fighting in the sense of using the bar, but it's, mm -hmm. that's what I would say that it was a tolerance of rather than compassion. Tolerance and compassion to me are very different. Tolerance means that you don't like, disapprove of, but you're willing to allow it to exist, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Compassion oh, yeah. is caring about the state of being of whatever sure. it is and wanting it to be more Right, in acting, some action is involved accordingly, but not of its own kind. I mean, uh, the violence that you're reacting to, you don't need that. I mean, killing another can't be justified on any ground, even oppression. Right? Yeah, then person Partly this is thought and words and trying to make a distinction, and it's interesting. And uh, but I guess I like the idea that compassion also involves to put you in a position to act, where tolerance, there isn't the action part. I mean, I, we haven't thought about this before, you know, but that's one way to go. Well, if the person is forced to be forced to tolerate, that means not to be compassionate. It is tolerance. When he doesn't have to be tolerant, then he doesn't have to be tolerant. Strong compassion. Mm-hmm. Oh yes. When you when you recognize that you are part of that that other uh, that is is suffering, that you also suffer when that other suffers, right? And that what that 
person who is defined as criminal is responding to in that life is also part of my life. I am not separate from that humanity. Then that is compassion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because in our culture, we grew up not, unfortunately, not with that tradition. And that tradition is something that's coming to us now. It hasn't been prevalent. Right. Yeah. Good point. Probably many of us have had so much of it in a traditional way that we have to go to the newness of something else. I mean, there are parts of Buddhism that are just as exoteric, bureaucratic, ritualistic, doctrinaire, and so forth. That if I were born in the East, I'd probably reject it and go to Christianity. The mystical Christian desert fathers to find inspiration. But I go to have not had that part of Christianity. Uh, so I go to what's happening in a, in, a, in a large part of the world that I think needs to come here for one thing, but also continue to look within Christian texts for the more mystical, esoteric tradition that's there in every religion, every denomination. But it tends to be the more bureaucratic, exoteric that gets emphasized because that's what builds a church. Seeing that God was in, within doesn't inspire a lot of bureaucracy. And it doesn't even require a religion to say. I mean, one of the most powerful and most influential movements that exists today under the, under the guise of the Alcoholics Anonymous traditions is not affiliated with a religion, but it's affiliated with a spirituality, a sense of powerlessness and or recognizing your powerlessness in the relationship to a higher mm -hmm. power, whatever it is. Well, right. For one thing, we're trying to make it compatible. And as I mentioned this morning, uh, coming back from China, uh, riding on the plane with a, a man who was studying in, uh, a man from China studying in uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia, saying that what was exciting for him was, with all the Buddhism, and he was a Buddhist, is that building in action, what is it to act then as a Buddhist? Uh, but also, there's an engaged Buddhism. But going back further to Taoism, uh, the idea is that if you place yourself in the right position, you act. You necessarily act. It's not passive. But you don't have to decide, well, I'm going to do this now because of that. That's when there's all kinds of conflict and you don't see things clearly. When you see things clearly and are there in the moment, then you sure you act against oppression or whatever it is, but you act correctly. So there, I think... The, the passive idea has been a, a misconception of Eastern philosophy or the kind of Eastern philosophy we've gotten. Mm -hmm. But that, that conception is changing, the practice is changing, it seems to me. And it seems to me that's one of the major, call it revolutions going on now. It's not a political revolution, though I mean the democracy movement is, well, it's political and spiritual, social. But is the coming together of East and West and a, a, and a new spiritual basis uh, for our being. And an ending of the dualism between sacred and the secular, that the religious, the spiritual, is something that we do just one part of our life, but it informs everything we do is filled. We can't get away from it. The ending of that dualism. That in the most mundane thing, there is the spiritual. The most mundane thing, doing criminal justice, is some kind of spiritual oh, act. Yeah, it doesn't just come from knowledge, we know that, because with all kinds of knowledge, we're still the same old corrupt, <laughs> uh, corruptible, the, oh, I'm just using words. But I mean, we haven't created a better world, and we 
are very much the same temperament and sensibility, but it involves what you know the religious traditions are saying, an opening of the heart, and finally you know in the heart. But it's the heart and the head coming together. But we spend much of our lives, you know, from here up, and still don't know. I suppose the way, you know, to think about that is that compassion is self-preservation. That when you are a part of all else and the suffering of all else, that is your preservation. Otherwise, you are lost. You've lost it. Now, that, that's not the way you thought about going with it, but I, that's it depends what it is to be lost or to be found, I guess. And what is preservation? I mean, you can lose your whatever and be... Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. and maybe in some situations, it's only the giving of your own life that you were saved, you know, and preserved. Mm-hmm. We're all sacrificing. I mean, having children is a sacrifice. You know, we. We sacrifice in a million different ways in order to preserve teaching. <laughs> I mean, the ultimate, I mean, the sacrifice, and we don't have a lot of rituals in our society for it. Joseph Campbell, in one of his tapes on you know, mythology, all the great cultures had some way of dealing with sacrifice, that you become one with the other. And that's the ultimate. Preservation is the sacrifice. But much of our culture promotes how can I have mine, how can I have the best of, and so forth, at the expense, often at the expense of somebody else or another class. Mm-hmm. We engage in kinds, of, it's hard to be rich without committing some kinds of crime against somebody. Oh. Oh, yes. And you are trying to give these people. Mm-hmm. If you know what you sacrifice self, what is compassion effort and what is the good of the Uh you mean for yourself or for the world? For the world. Well, you provide an example of what it is to be compassionate. Huh? A final example. Depends where you think it's going. Yeah. Uh, it's also brief anyway. I talked into conceptually which is what I think you characterize our police as being peacemaking. If you didn't take peacekeeping role, you going to be control it up. The world. That's, how, how to that's, that's a good point. Yeah.
Well, in the board program, the, uh, the victim, by understanding the situation of the uh, offender, is also healed, as well as the offender, seeing the nature of his act in a very concrete way, and not as an object removed from that person. So the process of rehabilitation for both people, a healing for one, a rehabilitation for the other. Burns? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, all along the way. Right. He might have lived a few years longer, but all along the way he would have denied that loss of ego and not have been a witness and example. That's true. We take risks. Uh, To lay down our lives, lay down our, law. our laws. Oh. No, there's too much material to be protected. That's accumulated by right. That's a good point. Yeah. The more interested you are, the more likely you're to be interested. To be hurt, harmed. All right. We make sacrifices, take risks of the self. And I guess this tradition says to go with it. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you all being here and Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.